up from this weekend. I woke up this morning feeling like I literally just needed a gallon of water and a plate of broccoli. Just, I've ate way too much this weekend, and we still have Thanksgiving to go to this evening. So, I'm thankful, but I'm about ready to not be so thankful for a little while. We'll be in uh, Colossians 1, verses 23, or 21 through 23. Uh, when, I, when I go to, to other churches, especially a church where I know the pastor as well as I do, um, I find it really hard to get real far away from just the, the basics of, of Christianity and, and what it is to be a Christian just, I mean, when you come to somebody else's church, it's almost like cooking in somebody else's kitchen. You, you just don't feel comfortable really venturing out too far away from just the basic standards. And I don't necessarily know that a lot of the time it is beneficial to get too far away from uh, the gospel. I mean, what, what, are we here for if not the gospel? I know I spoke on that the last time I was here and, and most of the people at our church probably think, man, this guy does not get very far away from the subject, but I just don't feel like it's really possible to. So we're going to read, we're going to read verses 15 through 23. But we're going to focus on the last three of those. And he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moving away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was reclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So we, we see Paul going into just the very, the very heart and soul of what this whole book is about here. It is the reconciliation of mankind unto God. Um, it says, although we were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. That, that idea that, that we were born into a, a fallen world and we were, we were not what we should have been but Christ came to make it a possibility that we could be reconciled unto the God that created us, that he gave his son in bodily form to pour out the wrath that we deserve, that we might, might be reconciled to our creator. And it says, and in that truth, if you are holding to that truth, it says, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Who, who here really feels that? Like, who here really feels that they are, are have been made blameless? Uh, now, we are still in our earthly body. I don't believe I need to tell anybody here that we still do 
fall from grace and sin at times, but we are we are owners of great grace and, and a, a grace that will bring us to the point of becoming holy and blameless and beyond reproach. I mean, beyond reproach with a holy God who is set apart from all, who is holy, 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 and we will be able to be in perfect relationship for eternity of eternities because of what he sent his son to do. And then you, you come down to verse three and it says, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast. And in, in verse chapter two, verse seven, he goes, goes back to this and he says, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him, established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude, this, this firmly rooted, firmly established. Now, when I, when I go out into familiar patches of woods that I've ran my entire life, if somebody was to go in there and pull up about six of the really, really big trees that I know as landmarks, I would become confused as to where I am. And the reason is that those trees have been there, some of them since probably Civil War times. I mean, they're huge trees. They, if they were not there, I would not really have confidence in knowing where I am. And that is, that is kind of the same. We are to be firmly established in this simple truth. Now, simple does not mean necessarily that it's all easy to understand. It just means that it is singular. It is, it is the truth. It is the simple truth that without this truth, nothing else matters. And this, the firmly established and firmly rooted and being steadfast in this, in the gospel, not in other things that are attributed to the Christian life. We, we are seeing this in our, in our country on, on all sides. This is not just a, a, a liberal versus conservative thing because both sides are polarizing themselves right now. We have the, the woke church, and then there's a reaction against that. There is literally movements taking place that are Trump churches. I mean, people who are coming together that use this Bible, but are worshiping a former president of this country. It is concerning. And we, we must make sure that we stand fast in the gospel. And now am I concerned in this church body with, with those extremes? Not, not necessarily. I, I know a lot of you and I just don't see that that's the, the concerning thing. But we, we have this on a personal level. You, you, you accept this. You, you become a Christian and then you, you feel almost like you need to move on. You need to, well, I've got to do this, this, this. If I'm not doing this, then I'm not, am I really what I am supposed to be. Well, you might not be as far along as you should be. That does not mean that that changes the fact of what you are. It says, you know, we're not to look to our performance, but to look to what has been performed for us. We have a savior who died for us. Now, our performance should be conformed to the grace that we have received, but that is not the grace that we have received, is not our performance. We, and that's, that's the struggle that Paul was having in the Colossians church. They, were, they had the, the Gnostics were coming in, and they, 
they felt like you had to have these special revelations and these these secret truths had to be given to you that weren't anywhere in the Bible. They were these special things that you had to have to be where you were supposed to be. And Paul's coming in here and saying, oh no, you just need the gospel. You need Christ crucified. And, and in that is the, that is the foundation for what we are to do in everything, in our marriages, in our workplace, everywhere. We are to stand on the gospel. Um, there was a, a preacher that I heard talk about when he was converted, he was just a, a heathen in college. And he had about a year left to go. And he went from being, you know, just a booze hound and doing all kinds of stuff. He gets saved. He starts handing out tracts. People that he was friends with or thinks he went insane. I mean, they just think he just lost his mind. And they, they pull him off to the side and they go, hey, you really need to settle down with this stuff. I mean, it's fine that you're religious, but you need to. People are laughing at you. And he just looked at them and said, what can I do? He died for me. I mean, that is, that is the simplicity of the Christian life. Everything that we do has to be because he did this. I must follow. I must stand and be firmly established and continue on in the faith. Even in times where we are seeing vast, vast groups of people getting distracted by by lesser important things. Then as, a, as almost a, an assurance, he goes on to say, and not moving away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Well, who had they heard this gospel from? And it, if you look at verse seven, it's just as you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And then in verse 13 of chapter, verse 12 of chapter 4, it says, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. So Paul is coming coming behind Epaphras and saying, this man, he, he knows the gospel. He has given you the truth that you need. Continue on in, his, in what he has told you. And in Philemon, we see that Epaphras is also, I'm pretty sure, at this exact time in prison with Paul. So Paul knows what this guy, it's not like he's just assuming that, that he's praying for these people in Colossae. Oh no, Paul hears these prayers. He knows what is in Epaphras' heart and his heart is for these people to continue on in the gospel. It says, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. I mean, Paul, he receives the gospel on the road to Damascus. He goes and he studies and he learns these things. And then he just, I mean, he goes everywhere a couple times and gets, I mean, gets beaten, gets shipwrecked, all these things for one purpose and one purpose alone. And that was the gospel. We have uh, a great need of just reminding ourselves day by day by day, even if you are a person who does not see other people throughout the day by day by day, we need the gospel. When we watch the news and we see all the things going on, we have to look at it through the lens of what Christ has done for us. If we don't, we will become like the Pharisees. Like in Mark chapter 2, when Jesus is with, 
as the Pharisees would call the sinners. He says, in hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I do not come to tell the righteous, but the sinner. Uh, like these, these Pharisees self-righteousness was holding them back from seeing the truth of who Christ really was, that he had come to reconcile, to be the person to bring about the perfect will of God, that, that we would be brought back, that we would be gathered like sheep, that he would, as he said, he would have to the Jews, like the chicks gathered under his wings, we, we must not look at people outside of this truth. And I, I am preaching to myself as much as anybody else in this room because I can watch the news and go instantaneously into, what is wrong with these people? Like, how in the world? And I'm not just talking about the, the, the most leftist people. I am talking about People on all sides who are just, they are so terrified of what is going on in this world and they are willing to sacrifice all for their own comfort or for the oppression of a people because they just don't like what they think. And we must, we must come together in the gospel. We must always be looking unto Christ and what he done, the finished work of what we have in Christ is, is so crucial to the church and to those outside of the church. Um, if, if we take these, if we take this truth and, and apply it to ourselves and to our, our individual situations i mean we're gonna stand out like like sore thumbs i mean it's just this is not this is not natural at all um i know even even in my own self looking back on how i used to be towards other people and now it's it kind of weirds me out sometimes i'm like i don't i don't know what's going on here but this is just kind of weird um but I mean, that is the power when you really come to grips with the fact that there was somebody who came down and really did die so that you wouldn't have to spend eternity under the judgment of God. That, that's, that's got to be powerful because there's no way around it. There's just not. And we've... We need to stand with with Paul and Ephesus and just say, "There's there's hope," because he says here that not to move away from the hope of the gospel is that not what every is there anybody here who knows somebody that says, "I don't want to have any hope," like everybody's hoping in something, I ain't. Mean, Really, everybody, there are people who are hoping in all kinds of things, you know, that, you know, that critical race theory will fix all our problems. And there is nothing that's going to fix our problems unless we are reconciled with the sovereign God of the universe. I mean, that's just, that's just folly to think that we in and of ourselves are going to just, we're going to fix it all. We're going to wind ourselves up. And we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna reconcile everything. I mean, at night we can't even you can't even really reconcile differences in in the people that you love the most. I mean, some of us might have seen that this week uh, being yeah. Thanksgiving. You know, you still have these just little clashes and all these things. There is no reconciliation outside of Christ. I mean, it's just, 
It seems so blatantly obvious once you see it. But until you do, you don't have hope. You have hope in all these things that are just, they're frivolous and they change constantly. Um, and we are supposed to be the ones that are, are showing that there really is a hope that you can stand on and that you can go forward in and that will save you and bring you to a place of great peace and joy. So that's, that is my message for this morning. I'm sure it's a little short for you guys, <laughs> especially. But Dad called me. At, uh, he messaged me Saturday morning. I, uh, I don't know what it is about preachers, but they can't get sick before Saturday. Or if they are, they just wait that long and don't give you any heads up. I don't know. But I've had people call me at like, 8.30 on Saturday. Hey, can you come and preach? I'm like, sure. Um, well, we'll see how it goes. But usually they end up with a shorter sermon than if I have a week to prepare. So um, I have an announcement that choir practice is at, is tonight at 2.30. Yeah. So if you're in the choir, 2.30 today. Not tonight. I'll... Uh, pray dear lord just be with us as we we go out of this place and that we would we would look to you and that we would that we would relish in in the truth that you've given us and that you would that you would be you would be with us in everything that we do and that we would look to you in everything that we do and that we would point people to this great and mighty truth that is the only power to save. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.